Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for another fantastic event as part of our Earth Laws Month, but also an important um, element within our Green Prince Exchange uh, webinar series. <clears throat> My name is Michelle Maloney. I'm the National Convener of the Australian Earth Laws Alliance, and I'm really pleased today to introduce Delwyn Jones from the EVA Institute, who will be talking about nature positive futures. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I live, work and play on the traditional lands of the Yagara and Turrbal people here in very beautiful North Brisbane. I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present and the emerging leaders and young people um, continuing to support culture and country and kin. Inside the Australian Earth Laws Alliance or AILA, we like to acknowledge both the remarkable civilizational culture of the first peoples of this continent and how they have cared for country and cared for each other since time immemorial. As a non-Indigenous person, I'm a descendant of the Irish folks who were brought to Australia unwillingly by the British Empire. I also like to acknowledge the ongoing impacts and legacy of colonization on first peoples and on country and our commitment inside AILA and our sister organizations, Future Dreaming and the New Economy Network uh, to play our part in challenging colonial ideas about this important and beautiful continent and challenging colonial ideas about our future and the ways that we can move forward together. So for those who are new to the AILA Earth Laws Month celebrations, we're actually halfway through September. We have something like 35 online events throughout September celebrating humanity's relationship with the living world, and in particular, how we govern ourselves as human earthlings. Today's talk by Delwyn Jones, who I really admire and respect immensely, is a very important part of the equation, particularly for those of us living in larger towns and cities, about rethinking uh, the impacts of our communities, uh, not just to be minimizing harm, but to actually be contributing back to nature. So this nature positive conversation is really important. Um, and we've just opened up Dell's slides so that we're ready to go. Um, but I will put in the link, uh, if you're not familiar with the Green Prince program that is created and run by AILA, I'll put some links in there for you. And later in October, we'll be holding some info sessions about our fun-filled Green Prince adventure that we're going to be hosting in 2023. So if you're interested in any of that, um, I'll put some links in later. But without further ado, and sincere apologies that you cannot see her happy smiley face, Delwyn's uh, video is not working, but her slides can be seen. But may I please introduce Delwyn Jones. And Del, do introduce yourself however you would like to. Um, over to you. And Del's going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have some Q&A. Thank you so much. Good day, all. I'd like to acknowledge the First Nations of Australia and then their ongoing um, knowledge, intelligence and activity that supports nature positive in Australia and overseas. So why nature positive? Basically, we don't have any other option. Um, how are we going to become nature positive? We have to actually go beyond this idea of getting to zero by measuring negative impacts and going beyond zero by starting to measure positive outcomes. All of the sustainability argument to date has actually been about unsustainability, at least in science. We've been focusing on the damages and how to fix them, but we really haven't been focusing on how to repair, heal, and regenerate the planet on which we live. We can regenerate natural habitats and ecosystems, the air sheds, the rainwater catchments, the marine, freshwater and terrestrial ecosystems. This takes a lot of local action and it has to be done um, on the ground by people who are living in that space because work done from afar runs into problems such as with colonialist, imperialist attitudes. You need the local knowledge to be able to really do well. So what are ecosystems? Ecosystems are communities of things that work together. So that's like your neighbourhood, your um, block, your town, your city. Habitats are the community places in which things live. So that's the address. 
Um, it's the particular space within an ecosystem that's special for those living things or those inanimate things. That's where we find our ore. That's where we find our little blue bees. So why um, are we concerned about ecosystems? Well, it's self-interest, basically. It's because the carbon that they draw down from the atmosphere, the plants, the algae, that can heal climate change, can break and heal climate change. Ecosystems basically act to generate oxygen that enables us to breathe. They catch rain, mainly because they have a lot of finely divided surfaces, such as in uh, leaf material, and that actually catches droplets, which reduces flash, flood, flash floods in our triple um, La Nina event summer that's about to happen, trees would have reduced our flash flooding. They degrade scrap, all our detritus feeders, worms, etc. They clean up the home planet. They create soil, the detritus feeders in the ecosystems, and that enriches our business so we can actually grow things to sell and so we can actually grow oxygen to. Um, create business and that can grow food which feeds us so there's a lot of reasons why we should look after ecosystems and why we need the earth to be nature positive nature positive is a un initiative and where do we have to do it and when do we have to do it we have to do it here we have to do it now we have um less than a decade to really start to learn how to do it and a few decades to really make a difference so the sustainability background and aspirations have been going on for a long time. And what they have in common since the Rio Declaration and the Agenda 21, um, I think over half a decade ago, is that they've lacked traction. One of the reasons they've lacked traction is because they feel too big and they've been focusing on complex systems, very big complex systems, and they feel very far from us we feel quite powerless and they have been influenced very much by multinational huge agglomerates and actions so it's pretty hard to find what um one small voice can do but as as we know one small voice can do much so the main driver of the problem is we're using up earth at a rate of more than one planet 1.8 to two planets, depending on what you're measuring. We want to become climate resilient. We need to have um, zero carbon because we have far too much in the atmosphere. We have way, way more in the atmosphere than what contributed to the dinosaur extinction. We have to get gains beyond zero, at least in, um, in carbon and in water as well as in nature. Um, we have to regenerate our habitat because we've lost too much. The outcomes that we're looking for are community wellness, justice and equity, certainly because for the next generation, the current one and the ones yet to be born, they are inheriting less than we inherited. So that inequity is unjust. We all need a work-life balance. And one thing that COVID did, did show us was that how a home-based work life uh, has its, has its um, uh, issues, but it also offers us some balance. And we want eco-positive choice. We want to actually be able to do something at individual level. So there's various movements. We have Nature Positive, which is about adding earthly and social resilience and to reverse nature losses. We have a movement around reciprocity, I can never get that right, which is basically pay kindness forward. Don't do play the blame game, it's really pointless. And we are looking at new frontiers in the circular economy, which are seeking qualifications. And some of the methods that I'm going to talk about today will enable the circular economy. We're also looking at the new frontiers of investment. And this is what Nature Positive does offer. It's a whole new frontier for investment. So what's nature positive about? So we've lost um, 
vast tracts of wilderness. We've lost many, many species, and we're in the sixth major extinction since historical records began on, on this planet. So we've lost most of our biodiversity richness um, since um, the Industrial Revolution. And the aim is to fill that gap as soon as possible. So it's not just to stop the loss, it's to reclaim new gains back to what we had, um, equivalent to what we had in um, a pre-industrial uh, world. Now that's not utopia, it's because we need it. We need that forest cover to create the oxygen and draw down the, the CO2. We need the biodiversity for, for medicine, for food, for a whole, whole host of things. So while I'm saying pre-industrial, some of it won't be exact, but the capacity for the benchmarks will be, has to be equivalent. Otherwise, the humanity has to shrink and we've made absolutely no progress in shrinking our population. So one of the um, issues that we're facing in Australia and we're the last nation on the earth to, to face it is we've finally getting colony collapse disorder with bees. Now, Einstein did say that when we lose the bees, we're pretty much done for because we depend on bees for pollinating our, much of our food, not all, but much of our food. And Australia and New Zealand were the last colony collapse disorder free um, places and where we were providing the bee stocks for um, the queen bees for the rest of the planet in many, many cases. But it's finally come, come here just in this last year. Um, it's mainly around mite infestations. One of the reasons we were the last continents is we have a kind of climate. So the overwintering for the bees doesn't require as much artificial feeding. So the bees had more natural resilience to the um, Varroa destructor mite, which is, is now destroying them. So it's really, really important to be able to look after our insect population. So we can't be spraying insecticides in our homes. We can't be spraying insecticides across our agricultural area indiscriminately, such as we have been. And part of the issue around um, the, the genetic modification of crops wasn't necessarily because of the concern about the genes we might um, ingest, but because much of the genetic modification was to make them um, make the crops resistant to insecticides to the point where we could, and industry does, particularly in America, add 10 times the amount of insecticide to the crop without actually hurting the crop. Unfortunately, this has um, flow on effects to our gut, gut flora and microbiota. And there have been a lot of issues associated with um, gut and neural um, deficits uh, with children from eating too much of this um, over insecticide loaded foodstuff. Um, and the bees are one of the indicators, the colony collapse disorder is one of the indicators of our unhealthy agriculture and our need to go um, uh, probiotic and our need to go um, uh, organic in, in agriculture and also to change our agricultural practices, which is happening now with using drones and um, different methods of dosing um, crops with insecticides. So if humanity's future depends on the restoration of damage beyond just stopping the losses, but actually restoring the capability of the natural ecosystems to um, manage our water, manage our oxygen, manage our carbon, manage our, our um, soil um, production and our food production. Um, what we've been focusing on in science is we've been focusing on measuring the damages we haven't been focusing as much as finding the solutions. 
Unfortunately, most of the solutions that are still on offer today have been around for a long time, but what they have suffered is they've suffered a lack of quantification. So the skeptics amongst us would say, well, that sounds very good, but you know, how's more koalas gonna help us or how are more bees gonna help us? So we need to be able to express the benefits in as strong a terms as we can express the damages. And this is the business of uh, the Ever Institute. So what we do as a method is we draw a boundary around our system. And here is the earth system. We count what goes in and we count what goes out. And then we measure the losses and gains and we express that in a particular way per functional unit or per outcome. So this, the solar energy flux is absolutely huge. And we are reliant on the fossil remains of the solar energy flux, what used to be, um, sorry, what used to be um, alive is now um, in coal, in oil, in a natural gas. So they, they used to be, um, natural gas used to be mostly living algae. Um, oil and coal used to be living living things, for example, for the plant. So our re reliance on the fossils is what has fueled the uh, industrial revolution. But um, we and we have exploited the air, land, and resources, air, land, and water resources on the planet, and the air, land, and water emission sinks on the planet. And unfortunately, they are finite. So we're running out of resources and we're certainly running out of places to put our junk. So what we're seeing in that respect is a lot of pollution. So we have a molten core we can't live in. Our biome is extremely thin. Here it looks like the uh, apple skin on the, on the apple. Our water is the blue, is shown here as the blue bubble on, on the planet. And um, that's a very small amount of water, and that's that is all the water on the planet: fresh water, steam, mist, marine water, all. And the little pink ball is all the air on the planet. So you can see why we only have a very small part of the planet that we can live on. We only have a very small amount of water, and we only have a very small amount of air, considering the size of the planet. But what we do have is a huge amount of energy available, which we don't make very much good use of. The reason we don't is because it is it is free and it has been very hard to capitalize on the investment in the renewables. And this is luckily being transformed over the last 30 years and we're able to do that through technology. So the problem is we have ecophobic cities, so we, we kill our possums, we kill our worms, we kill our insects. We have generational injustice. We have used up so much resources and so much of the sinks on the planet that the next generation um, is inheriting um, much restricted futures. We have an extinction rebellion worldwide um, started by one young woman. Um, so one, one small voice can make a difference. And we have a lot of science deniers. And the reason we have science deniers is that we've been speaking about bad news and there's um, bad news and blame games generally get attacked and that's what's been happening. Now the solutions in the eco-positive world, in the nature positive world is to account benefits and gain, to create ecophilic cities where people actually look after the place they live in and the place and the, the living things that they share it with, that we aspire to and deliver generational, in, generational justice. There's very little point in mortgaging our, our lives to, to create um, the next generation if we are going to give them um, less than we had. And we need to all be seen as climate breakers, breaking climate change, putting the brakes on climate change. We all need to be seen and act as science synergists to work with the science and demand the understanding um, and demand the messages that you need to be able to figure out what you want to do. Science is basically an argument and scientists are generally not the great communicators 
that cartoonists and songwriters and musicians and artists are. So we need this synergy with the artistic and science community to get the message out so we have this understanding. So here this little funnel is from the, the natural step and they say that our natural resources capacity has been outstripped by our demand over time, that we're reliant on fossil fueled mined and toxic materials, consumptive patterns and inefficiency and inequity, which is all true. And the future is in renewables, biodynamics, regenerative um, um, forestry and agriculture, and natural um, mine sites, returning them to their, their pre-mining capacity, and it's in synergy. So what does ever do? So we assess things to declare sustainability outcomes. We assess the bad news, the reliance on fossil stuff, which is all dead, and the good news versus reliance on um, nature positive outcomes. We do this because we have to break the loss and the damage, and we want to accelerate the gain and the benefit. So what do we do? We do eco-labeling and decorations. The methods we use are called life cycle analysis. We've developed life cycle benefit analysis, and this is a world first. We develop inventory databases for how the world works and all the systems in, the, in it. I liken it to um, the doll's houses I used to build um, when my daughter, daughter was young. So we have in our databases, everything the world needs to work, and that's what we model. So we're an agent for open LCA freeware that most universities use and many, many industries use. And we have issued an LCI database, um, which is used by most universities in Australia and many worldwide. Um, we have associates and interns in Australia, in Europe and South Africa. We train professionals, we support projects, and we supervise postgrads. So here is historically some of our projects that we've worked on. I started in LCA in 1995 on the Olympic Stadium work. Um, then I moved to Queensland. We worked on public works in Queensland. Then we worked with the CRC for construction innovation, and we worked with um, global partners, for example, the builders of the KPGM offices in Rotterdam. The, we worked on the Sydney Metro for the winning bid, yay us. We worked on Queensland Main Roads. We worked the, with the US Stanford University on, on their Green Dawn. And we are custodians of those databases. So um, the organizations who employ us put a great deal of trust in us to keep their commercial interests secret, which we have thus far succeeded in, in doing while also enabling freeware development and issuing. And here are some of the clients. And the, we've worked on BIM modeling, which is building information modeling. So it enables virtual design. And you can see here a model of it, it's very powerful. It hasn't taken off very much as well as expected since the global financial crisis, but it is a, um, a technology for the future. It enables us to do our work without having to measure every single item in our building information model because it gives automatically gives the dimensions for all the items in the model. So what have we done first? Well, we did the first Green Olympics. We did the first um, building information modeling automated life cycle analysis, and that was in KPMG head office. We did the world's first carbon positive build modeling. We've done the first world, the world's first positive LCA in an environmental product declaration. We have the first world, we've done the world's first LCA rate eco label with Global Green Tag here in Australia, which is also worldwide. Um, we have we issued the world's first free nine greater than 900 operation database. That is now the world's most popular inventory. And we did Australia's first EPD. So we're used to breaking, um, breaking new ground. And that's what Australians are, and New Zealanders are particularly good at. So this is an image of the world's first carbon whole life building design. It was a model for the ECA. 
the things I'd like you to look at here are the positive benefits that are measured. Retention of feedstocks, retention of minerals, renewable energy, the renewable matter in the, in the content, the renewal reliance on water supply, on rainwater supply, climate breaking, um, pH buffering, hail wellness for humans and clean air sheds. So those are all world firsts in terms of apps of measuring the metrics per square meter, cradle to grave over a particular design right. And that was done in many ways through the green walls, the landscaping, the atrium and the green rooftops, as well as in all the materials that were selected. This is a, um, an image of the, uh, the world's first positive EPD. Again, here, I'd like you to look at the metrics, energy recovery, water recovery, fuel recovery, mineral recovery, resource recovery. In many ways, that's reliant through reliance on post-consumer recycled content. Usually that doesn't explicitly get um, talked about. We can also look here at human wellness. Human wellness is very strongly related to just avoidance. Excuse me, Michelle. <clears throat> Sorry yes. to interrupt. It's Michelle. Um, I can't quite wait, make out which product this is. This is very. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. So this is a an e diverter. So this is um, a high rise um, garbage chute. Yeah. And what it does is at the bottom of the chute there is a trap door which um, closes or moves, so it uh, diverts the waste either to a garbage bin or to a recycle bin, and then they're picked up. So there's no need to have a separate, separate recycling bin. There's no need to use the lifts separately. Um, you've just used the existing diverter. So, so that a, product is the first environmental product declaration that you have supported being nature positive. Yes, that's the first one that was ever um, explicitly reported on. This is worldwide as wow. having particular nature positive outcomes and this Thank is you. very much cradle to grave counting the resources that are saved by enabling recycling it doesn't it the the shift was from i think from memory something like 10 percent recycling to 36 percent recycling for the for the building right. so it makes it clarifying yeah yeah so it makes a huge difference thanks for interrupting um, so healthy air sheds, organic safe air and ozone layer, layer repair. So, uh, for example, our um, cancer, uh, skin cancer rates are very much linked to um, having an ozone safe environment, an ozone layer safe environment. So the ozone layer has started to mend within 30 years of the activity aimed at stopping the hole getting any bigger. So we can turn these things around globally, and we have already done so. As soon as we uh, enacted the laws to, to do so and enabled people to do so, we have made these global changes before, and we can do it again. Um, again, positive ecosystem replenishment here, climate breaking, water clarification, avoided e ecotoxicity, ecosystem recovery, and habitat recovery. And these are measures, and these units are the standard units to be using in our field. So we haven't had to reinvent the wheel, as it were. We just had to change the math and change the focus. These, this is a picture of the flow charts that we look at in order to be able to do our work from the cradle to the grave and looking at all the particular processes. And that's what are in our databases. So what we, do we do best? Well, we have issued the world's most popular database. So we're pretty proud of that coming from a dinky little country in terms of population size. So what do we do? We declare damage assessments. So these are the kind of damages that are usually the bad news damages that are reported. This one is for um, uh, a public hospital. So we usually count the water use, the energy use, the fossil fuel use, the uh, amount of resource depletion, the amount of organic compounds that we inhale, and the amount of dust and inorganic compounds that we inhale, neither of which are very good for us. 
ozone layer depletion. That's what we normally do. But for example, in that ECHA interpretive design, we can start to look at positives. So rain catchment, potable effluent, drought safety, flood safety, better health, um, all these passive comfort, buying local, cleaning air, biodynamic reliance, growing food, reuse of materials. Now, in terms of um, the interpretive center design image here, anybody can do this kind of counting. You don't need to be a full on life cycle assessor to be able to do those things. You just have to decide what's important to you, um, how much you use those things last year, what you're doing this year and what you plan to do next year and track your improvements and chart your improvements. So the um, life cycle benefit assessment that we've invented and that we've been using since 2014 was the first one we did. Um, it, it has to report on the problems as well as the solutions. So we do the traditional damage assessment and we do um, the benefit assessments as well. And we compare the difference and you may be able to get a net benefit or just a partial improvement. So, and sometimes we don't make any, any change in things, but we can make changes um, that still matter. So the, this is an example of comparing, for example, freshwater loss and freshwater regain through recycling or rainwater catchment. Soil loss versus replenishment, for example, in composting, air purification in, um, and versus air pollution, for example, in filtering or using trees to um, capture dust before it gets into a home. Um, biodiversity loss versus biodiversity regain, usually around forestry. It can be in... Um, soil redevelopment for microbiota, and it can be in um, agriculture. Climate change versus climate breaking. And our students at um, the, um, in the University of Leiden and Delft, the master's students, they met, this is their chart, and they mapped what was unsustainable in the dark red versus sustainable, which is in the lighter red, which is within the carrying capacity. So it's acceptable, it's not reclaimed, it's not regained, but it's, it's marginally sustainable versus regenerative. And the regenerative up the top is actually replenishing what has been lost recently um, since 1700s. So we're, our methods leveraging off conventional impact assessment methods, such as shown here, the, um, can you see my mouse on this, Michelle? No. Yes, okay. no, I can. And you can, okay. Sorry, I'll just so, have to mute. Yeah. That's <laughs> okay. So counting damaging loss of security is what our uh, field has been doing up until recently. And, and that's fair enough because there's a lot of damage to count and you need to be able to assess how big the damage is before you can argue for the resources to prevent them. But we also count the increase in the gain to capacity, which is community wellness, habitat capacity, and resource cycling, cycling percent and supply regeneration. So we measure, for example, as well as ozone depletion, ozone security, as well as air quality, air um, pollution, we measure air, air quality security such as dust avoidance and dust capture such in filtering, for example, or using uh, an organic, um, as in labeled organic um, material, which is life safe versus a chemical which is toxic. We measure um, terrestrial repletion, re marine repletion, riparian repletion, I don't know how many of you know about the dead spots in the ocean where there are, they've run out of oxygen, so there's no living things in those spots anymore. And um, Australia has been doing amazing work in replenishing marine near, um, near shore kelp beds and um, 
habitat for um, oysters and fish and um, seaweed and marine life to regenerate. And um, we've had huge successes there in restoring oyster beds, for example. Um, and we look at feedstock viability and flood viability. So it is complicated. Um, life cycle assessment and damage assessment is one of the most complicated things you could ever try and do. But good science is the simplest science. So we always try to distill it to what is simple. And I'll show you later on some of the charts that you can do, which is really good, simple science. You don't have to um, go as far as we go into damage assessments. But we do certified work. If it's certified, it has to be, um, it's pretty tricky and someone has to put their reputation on the line to say, yes, that's certified, it's true. So this is a reflection of the recipe uh, method, which is the world's most popular method. It's out of Europe, it's out of, um, mainly out of Holland. The reason most of this work comes out of Holland, and if I was in the room, I'd ask you why that might be the case. Um, the, the Netherlands is at greatest risk from climate change, from inundation, from marine inundation, because it's such low-lying low land. Netherlands means low-lying land. And um, if, um, if, uh, the Netherlands goes underwater, then Germany is next because it's just downstream and it also has a lot of low-lying land. And as we've seen, floods are a huge and growing risk everywhere in the world. So benefit assessment looks at the opposite of everything that, that the impact assessment or damage assessment looks at. So it's a matched set wherever possible and we can match it about 96 percent of the time sometimes it's a bit hard but um we're clever and innovative so we look here for example at um regenerating urban systems now the urban space offers huge opportunity for um carbon uh, drawdown in gardens and grass verges in domestic food production in rooftop gardens and in um, green walls. And Michelle, a month ago, showed a, an image of Brisbane, for example, 50 years ago, and it was a green space, the city, um, versus now, which is a concrete gray space. So there's not a lot of living stuff there. And if there's not a lot of living stuff there, it's not nature positive and you're not drawing down carbon and you are subject to flash floods. You're not producing oxygen for your, in, your inhabitants. You're not producing food for your inhabitants. And none of those are very good. In a nature positive space, they would be, the cities would be green. They would be drawing down carbon. They would be catching their flood waters. They would be catching their rain waters or their flash flood waters. They would be growing their own food. They would be growing soil. So here we um, count species risk, species richness, habitat richness, regenerated areas in terms of farms, urban spaces, and natural spaces like in parks, and regenerated marine spaces. Most cities in the world are on waterways because we used to rely on sailing to get around. And um, so the cities are effect and are influenced by their freshwater um, environments and their marine environments. So we can make a great deal of change with these two environments, which are in our own living space. Um, in Germany, I sailed down the Rhine about five years ago and people were fishing in the Rhine for the first time in decades because it was such a polluted waterway. Similar things are happening on the Thames where industrial waterways are returning to um, wellness and regeneration. So this is a simple nature positive report card. It's what it looks like. And every city can do one based on your own, what you spend on these particular outcomes. And you don't need much help from the Ever Institute to be able to turn what you're buying into a particular metric because you can use um, 
the free databases to be able to model um, how much oxygen you're generating, how much carbon you're drawing down or generating. And you can use your own measures for noise pollution and your own assessment of how much reliance you are on biodynamic agriculture and what your food miles are, what your open space is, how much habitat you're regenerating in your neighborhood or in your block or on your front garden or in your own garden or in your school. And you can make your own estimates of your disaster security in terms of um, your flood mitigation. And we're not doing very well in flood disasters. We're doing abysmally in um, bushfire disasters and the climate change is only making those things worse now and at a great rate. But that's what one looks like and it's very easy to map what you used to do, where you want to go, what you're doing now and compare it to 1750 or pre-industrial or pre-invasion day. So for example, you're, if you're living say in Brisbane, and you're living in an ordinary urban space and you're mowing your front verge, your soil carbon will be something like three or four percent. Pre-invasion, it was about 15 percent in all likelihood. So if you can stop planting your grass and plant a native um, habitat in your verge, you will be becoming nature positive, you will be drawing down carbon, you'll be removing reducing flash floods, you'll be increasing soil carbon in your, in, your, in your soil. You'll be cleaning the air, you'll be doing a favor for the plants, for the bees, for your, for your neighborhood, and um, you'll, you will be starting to be nature positive. And indeed, Brisbane needs to be doing that all across every verge on the, on the, in the city. Um, so this is a weather text, which is a, a, a um, wood product grown in northern New South Wales, which was the first platinum eco label issued by Global Green Tag. Now, if you look up here on your evaluation category list, all those are bad things. So we did not, or we have not yet done a, a benefit assessment <clears throat> on, on the best eco-label there is available in Australia in terms of the best product. So it's very hard to sell your product, even if you, you have a, make a claim that you are platinum, which is the top rank, if, <clears throat> if all you can give is bad news on any one of these, I'll let you read them while I have a sip. And while you have a sip, Del, I might just check in with you how much time you wanted for questions. We've got about 15 minutes left for the session. Okay, well, the rest are just really quick examples. So, um, which we may get to as well, but I will leave you to um, stop me okay. <laughs> if I go over and I'll rush a bit more now. But the problem with this that I'm making out is even the best in class was just bad news before we started to. Um, do the benefit assessment. So the world's biggest um, steel maker, the, the, our competition for Australian steel making has a, a greenfield site, park, and every um, hectare is covered with either um, solar panels or um, water catchment uh, or some nature positive device. So people are starting to do it. So before everybody should really nearly go and start doing um, um, what they think is best, it's good to check out where your biggest impacts lie. And generally they lie in the use phase. So here's a cold supermarket um, in Victoria and this red spot is the in use for the energy, energy use and it's the same for the, for the carbon production. So, for them, rather than to change their actual buildings, they need to change their energy provider or need to create um, more solar energy and insulate the places and change their refrigeration technique, which they've done. And um, Coles has a commitment to be um, carbon zero and nature positive. 
So industry is doing its bit. We now have um, um, mini mills doing done testing and producing carbon zero aluminium, carbon zero cement, carbon zero steel, and carbon zero wood, and I'll go through those now. So most of the carbon from aluminium comes from the cathode and anode, which are made from uh, pitch, which is from a fossil fuel. So changing those to um, biochar reduces the uh, carbon emissions by about something like half, but also using a hydrogen um, fuel um, for the electricity is is going the, the rest of the way. And there are a lot of other processes involved in this inert anode smelting technology. Now we already have aragonite biomineral limestone in all of our cement or most of our cement produced today. And one of the byproducts or accidents of climate change is we are killing a lot of animals in the near marine zone. So we have a lot of fresh limestone, which mainly comes from bone. And so, for example, there's a vastly increased amount of aragonite biomineral coming out of our solar plants that make our salt production um, in um, Salt Creek in, in Adelaide, as well as in the Pearl River Delta in, in China. So instead of using lime, fossil limestone, we should be using aragonite biomineral limestone carefully, but there's, it's already here. There are other carbon zero concrete um, technologies, including using um, cement to host bubbles of nitrogen. So it becomes a catch or a bank of, of carbon dioxide that hopefully won't leak. So there are many ways of making um, carbon zero steel. Um, one of the most popular that's being tested is the use of reliance on hydrogen. Another one that Blue Steel is talk, that Blue Scope Steel is talking about is also using biochar instead of coal. So that's renewable um, carbon instead of the carbon in coal to reduce its pig iron, to reduce the iron ore to, to pig iron. Um, so that's already happening. It's only just started, so it will take decades to become um, commonplace, but it has started. So uh, we've always had zero or carbon positive wood, but since we've cut down most of the world's forests, we have to be very, very careful um, in buying only forest certified products um, of wood. Otherwise, you're very likely to be buying um, parts of the um, Amazon, which you don't particularly want to cut down, or the um, uh, uh, Indonesian uh, rainforest, which we also don't want to see removed. So um, again, we're looking at positive schools. Here's a, another little eco label, which any school can do. And we did these for the Victorian government and the headmasters were really chuffed to think that they could do a net positive report card. And again, it was counting what was what they could do on their campus, which was useful and valuable for them um, to be rain reliant, to grow some organic food or use some organic food, to reuse paper, to recycle stuff, to um, actually act to break climate, to, to clean the air, to do compost, to grow habitat, to care for fauna and to be renewable. So Del, would it, yep. would it be a good time to just pause for a moment? And um, yep. I'd love to ask a couple of questions about how, like literally how could, for example, Regen Brisbane start to engage in these approaches um, and do you, would you like to do that because we really only got about eight minutes left and then we're finished. Okay okay I would like and I would back the verges and the home gardening roof gardens and um, uh, and um, green walls yep. um, as the easiest most um, in highly engaging beneficial socially connected, socially cohesive, community-driven, nature-positive initiative that you can do. Yeah. Um, because then everybody can do something, even if it's um, growing your own carrots, growing your own tomatoes. Doing or growing something. native plants for possums and bees. Yes, certainly yeah. 
certainly supporting all you can with local honey produce um, and local beekeeping. Looking after, having a bee hotel, looking after the native bees is huge. Native bees do, do an awful lot of um, um, uh, repollination, pollinating, um, as, as do insects of, mm. of food species. So that's very important. important. And so, Del, if we wanted to move past that and then get a bit more um, sophisticated as community groups advocating for a nature positive city, which is what Regen Brisbane is all about. How do we move towards looking at the buildings themselves? Is that going to be something that is all about retrofitting greenery onto buildings and also looking at new build? Or how, you know, what in your experience, what are the best ways to address some of that? The largest um, group of um, materiality you can look at is saving what's already done. Right. We have a fairly large asset base and we don't replace much of it every year with new builds. So reuse of builds, tiny houses, I design tiny houses, um, having that kind of infill situation where people aren't mortgaged to the hilt or the death. Um, so they can have um, fitness for purpose within the existing streetscape and urban space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Having um, more uh, retrofitting that was multi-purpose and that is less concreted in so having a lot more uh, modular fit outs and certainly um, insulate and using reflective um, reflective surfaces like um, verandas and that kind of thing so we um, don't build ourselves into ovens where we have to turn on the air conditioner yes. we have to turn on the air conditioner let it be solar powered um, um, but yes, yeah, certainly retrofitting and looking after our existing buildings. I mean, I live in a, um, a nineteen ninety sorry eighteen ninety five Queenslander that was moved to make way for a high rise out of um, Brisbane, and I moved it up to or trucks moved it up to to Mount Tambourine, and it's worked very nicely for the last twenty two years. Yeah. So and that that's a whole recycled house and. Brisbane does that particularly well. Yeah. Um, so reusing and make uh, making adaptive reuse and clever reuse of what you have is is the best way because we can do it now. We don't have to wait for the opportunity to new, to do new builds. Yeah. And I don't know if you can comment yet, Dell, but I know for those who don't know, um, we have many plans to bring Dell into some more detailed workshops with us for Regen Brisbane and other Regen communities who are interested. Um, but in terms of actually sitting down and working out how can community groups advocate for this and what are for example, the barriers to it, like council bylaws or laws and regulation. Is that an area that your group works on or who do we just get legal advice for? Well, actually, you're not, not allowed to have this or that in a community. Uh, how do we work all those things out? Well, it, it takes local people to become citizen science, sorry, citizen scientists to work on those things yeah. themselves as um, like, like Gail Delliston that we have. Um, on Shady Lanes, who's yes. become expert in those things. So if you find your passion, find where, where you um, want to work, find people that want to work with you or want to work against you and have the conversation, then ask people like me or other people who are specialists in the fields that you want how to get around it and engage them in the conversation because they too are probably in the space I was in 2010 yeah. Whereas only for only working on the damages and I couldn't get my head around the benefits. So it takes the conversation and looking at the roadblocks and figuring out how you can get around the, the roadblocks. So it, it takes us all and it's all a learning journey. And it's it's not it's not easy, but it's really rewarding when you really crack it and you think, oh my goodness, that's what we're going to call it, climate breaking. Mm. You know, we didn't have those words before. Mm. Um, so it takes personal involvement and, and something that you're interested in. If it's bees, if it's possums, if it's um, food, if it's inequity, if it's enabling First Nations, whatever it is, um, you know, mm -hmm. get involved because 
Otherwise, you're part of the problem. I couldn't agree more, Del. Um, there are two questions. I've sort of touched on Zoll's question. She was saying, this session is incredible. It proves that the fear that we can't do this is wrong. We just need the imagination, commitment and resources. Are there any similar projects globally? And I think she asked that just before you gave the example. Um, sorry, the name of the project escapes me. Um, but other examples overseas. Can you perhaps identify any cities or places that are doing this well yet? Um, well, there's a few. Um, I can't remember the name. There's a place in Cuba who did this ages ago and did it particularly well. There's um, some towns in Scandinavia who are doing parts of it really well. Um, we have colleagues in Europe and America who were doing bits and pieces of it really well, mm -hmm. like um, the benefit advantages in food uh, or um, in various other things. But we're hosting um, a session at the, with, in Dublin next year on, on this particular subject. Mm -hmm. And so we're starting to bring it to the science community globally. And we have delivered presentations on it at two preceding pre-COVID conferences mm -hmm. um, in, in Europe. And so there was this interest. People were starting in, in, in small ways particularly social benefit assessment. Um, so if the person wants to email me, I can probably find out what's happening in their particular space, but it's just starting. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and can I please encourage everyone who's listening either today live or to the recording, um, do get in touch with the Green Prince Project because we are going to be collaborating with Dell um, in a number of places around Australia to start in a very humble way because there's no funding but there are people who are super keen to start collecting information working out where towns and cities are up to and any of this and then making steps forward so in region brisbane we've already had dell gail from shady lanes um, and kira um, actually put in a little funding proposal trying to get some funds to start doing uh, what shady lanes helps people understand what to do with planting trees and making all of our uh, verges far more eco-positive <clears throat> sorry that was a bit enthusiastic wasn't it eco-positive <laughs> um yeah so there's a lot that's going to be happening now there is a great question here um from dawn saying do you run any basic courses on this and before you answer del um maybe we can tee up some workshops uh with green prints next year where everyone can get into basic courses and be um connecting with your work um yes we've had been taking interns for about five years um but they go on to the real world and it, then they struggle <laughs> so yeah. i don't know how much we're doing them favors but yeah happy happy to do some courses we have um a, a comms associate here who will be doing a lot more podcasts and coursework around that and we've just started a project with um um an amazing group from that came to us after our last presentation and they do a lot of these regeneration projects and so we're enabling them to report the benefits and certify the benefits which will enable them to get funding and their clients to get funding and to get the return on investment for more of these things and that's in australia <laughs> that's in australia that's locally that's um um with queensland Queensland, Queensland government um, projects. Excellent. Um, well, we might pick your brains to get more info about that too, so we can collaborate with anyone who's already taking these steps. Um, yes, I, I think our, um, our project partner, they won't have any trouble coming forward. Yeah. Okay. It sounds Under their own steam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, folk, um, I know this is just a fascinating and really full area. Um, so please do consider this introduction to nature, positive work, uh, and that if you're interested, there will be many more opportunities to connect with Dell's work and um, engage with uh, nature positive um, projects, I hope, uh, across the regenerative um, network here in Australia. But certainly Ayla, Green Prince, um, Regen Brisbane and a few other Regen groups are going to be engaging with this as best as we can with our abilities. Um, over the coming 12 months. So do stay in touch. 
Um, Del, did you have any other um, final things you wanted to share before we start to wrap up? Um, yes, I'll probably go towards the end if, if I may just rush through these slides without speaking. Sure. So that's another example. Toilet paper was my favorite. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard anyone say toilet paper is my favorite before. Oh, if if you're doing it in a regenerative way instead of in a pooey way, it's a great thing. Really. I'm sure it is. So this is on communications and training. This will be in um, a copy that will be online. You'll have a copy of this that people can look at. Yes, thank um, you. that's a summary. Um, so. Oh, so this is what I wanted to get to um, that yep. you need to look at and understand, which is messaging positivity in your own language. And it, it, it brain, it's brain hurting for a short while, but once you catch it, <laughs> you're all right. You'll get yep. there. Um, takeaways, that's just the summary. But the final, final one was thank you, all of you. Who are you? You're you. Where does it have to happen? It has to happen here and here to now. Here and now. We have to go beyond creating and measuring negative impacts to zero. Just to get to zero, we have to have some positive in outcomes to cancel yeah. out some of the negative too. The best way is by regenerating natural habitat. And that's because they do great things for us. We're not being, um, we're not being soft-headed. We're not being overly kind or wacky. They do good things for us. They service ecosystems, service us, service humanity. We shouldn't be destroying them. Here, here. Yeah. For the beach. Thank you so much, Del. Does it, everyone's still here? So, does anyone have any very quick questions for Del? I'm aware that we're over time, but um, if you did have a quick question, I think people are absorbing. And Del, you'll be able to send those slides to me so we can include them yes. when you share. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Thank you. And if somebody wanted to have the words with them, I'm happy to put the notes pages in for anyone who wants to lecture with them or whatever. Oh, we'd love to have received them too, mostly so we can communicate to others that this is a really important part of the Green Prince approach. So, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, send it through to us, Del. Well, look, I'm um, getting a lot of lovely comments that how this has been inspiring and positive and showing us that things can be done. We don't just have to give up. Um, so I think that's pretty fantastic. Uh, Alicia says, that was fascinating and uplifting. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. So Del Jones, thank you so much. We're going to drag you back into more Green Prince activities very soon and certainly lots of fun-filled times here in Bris Vegas. So I can't wait. And I'm sorry we can't see your lovely face. <laughs> That's okay. And I wash my hair and everything. Oh, <laughs> when one works from home, it is the ultimate sign of respect, isn't it? I had a shower for you people. <laughs> All right. Well, if folks, if you would like to just press the little clap button or um, do what I do, which is the daggy air clap, let's say a huge thank you to Dell. Such a huge body of work and hard work for many, many years um, prior to now coming into our world, which we're excited about. And yeah, if anyone's got any questions for Dell, shoot them through to Ayla, or if you've got Dell's email, shoot it through to Adele and um, join our mailing list if you haven't already. And we'll keep you in touch with practical ways of exploring how we ordinary humans can do all this stuff together. We're always looking for um, pro bono or tiny projects to see if we can give you a bit of a kickstart, um, not, not spending too much time, but to see if we can help. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Del, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and just a quick plug, we've got more awesome uh, Earth Laws Month project projects, events coming up. Tomorrow, we've got a little update from the Regenesis Arts Collective. Um, we've got an uh, in conversation with Tim Hollow tomorrow night about living democracy. We've got some green extractivism discussions on Friday, which anyone in this call would probably find very interesting. Some work being done by AidWatch about the um, acceleration of uh, mineral extraction for the good stuff, which is renewables. But if we don't manage human demand, we're gonna end up with some new problems that look a lot like the old problems. Many other projects as well, but do jump on that Earth Laws website if you'd like to join more free, awesome webinars. And speaking of awesome, thank you, awesome Del Jones, for sharing your time with us today. And we will now release you back into the wild. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye, people. Thanks, Del.